Hi, I'm Cassandra Caverhill, and I'm honored to introduce tonight's poet, Chloe Watson. In her piece, Our Child Before the Rain, she writes, The nakedness I fear is here again, wild and gray, dim as a child's tears. As you'll soon discover, Chloe is a powerful poet of naming. Using evocative language, her work crystallizes the loneliness and grief that persists between people and the alienation that exists within the self. I scratch open my body while dreaming, she says in Yellow Moon, describing both the physical and metaphysical aches of the body. Pain is the poet's portal, and Chloe is exceptionally skilled at incorporating personal totems and symbols into her work from lupins to blood, to the moon and teeth, to the sky in all iterations of weather, the external landscape is used to explore the poet's ever-shifting moods. Chloe's work examines fears and unfulfilled dreams through a complex array of associations and conflicting emotions. My hands nag me to find honey somewhere, she writes in the tenderness. And Chloe does so, aptly, her poetry conjuring the magic and mystery of a body forced to reckon with existence. And while her poems are often quite serious, you wouldn't guess that her wry sense of humor and self-deprecating manner make Chloe one of the funniest members of our poetry cohort. I'm grateful for her constant friendship and for her poetic voice, which is singular in its scope. Born and raised in Dayton, Ohio, Chloe's poetry has appeared in Mosaic Literary Magazine, The Algony Review, Defunct Magazine, Ohio's Best Emerging Poets, Beyond Literary Magazine, excuse me, Beyond Words Literary Magazine, and is forthcoming in Dreams Walking. Please welcome Chloe Watson. Hi everyone, um, I'm Chloe Watson, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm assuming that you read Cassie's introduction, so I'm just gonna go right ahead and jump into my poems. Um, so I'm gonna start out with a poem that I think of as an origin story, and for those of you who don't know me, I did grow up in Dayton, Ohio, and I recently um, returned there to live, so that is what this poem is about. The tenderness in a star is in its lighting. It's way making when the world is somber. Every night we spent elsewhere, each star was a mother, prodding us to come home, and we did. I smelled nothing. You driving us through the city limits, a concrete overpass telling us that someone loves Taylor D. The blue painted flowers that had once seized her name, fading, no smell, no revelation, no GPS needed here for you. I had tried to forget. I suspected your mother used to hit you here since you let your distant father do it with a belt. This news came with no image, as news you cannot bear often does. When you visit her, I mostly sit and stare, my hands aching to let you know of your blooming, to dig beneath you with my nails. I am here now at the laundromat, my own mother scrubbing blood from a white comforter as I sit still, eyeing the fresh gash on her arm, and now my stomach is braiding itself through the image of her reaching, falling for a vodka bottle in the night. She is wearing the necklace I bought her, two circles overlapping, one bigger than the other, and my hands nag me to find honey somewhere. Sometimes I have the power to daze bees, but my hands do not smear amber sweetness across her wound, letting it seep down into the secret parts of her. They stay in my lap, unlit from within. 
Okay, so the next poem I have for you all is titled, My Mother, a Lupine. I stand here at a flower market in London, glancing sideways at the lupines next to me, resting my thumbs on a daisy's petals, my hands bulky, now dappled with a few brown age spots, just as my mother's must have been the first time she plucked a lupine from a Colorado mountain. But just as it was plucked, that young lupine was deciding for itself whether to be, the core of its world and its heat maturing into a fixed coolness in my mother's hand. Maybe she laid that dried out thing beneath my father's pillow the day they conceived me, the day my mother's body began to prepare me for bursting into the world, hot, covered in life, screaming for nothing and everything. And purple valleys are something to miss, their occasional hues of clarity streaming across the eyes, the more tender rays of sun mingling between stems with shadowed sisters. I stand here at a flower market in London, one hand on a lupine, beneath my chest a secret pump, and count the loose change I would lose trying to thaw my heart to you, mother, trying to pluck out the fixed in us, leaving us to be. All right, so the next poem that I have for you all in this little sequence is titled Passenger. Here it is, the deep flowering of smoke, grief unfolding its many patterns as if it were separate clouds, how foolish to give away that you think this is proper poetry, that you believe beauty is twin to the pain, the filth of us. You sit in a darkened car with your lover, speeding down the freeway, and you know it is not enough sitting there together. The warmth of the pretend heat, the rustling of a shopping bag, the snow so separate and slow, the laziness of being a passenger, your body, your body dangling before sleep as if a heavy wind chime, are all a part of the sitting, are an extended answer of times falling. Okay, so the next two poems I have for you all are about my love for children, um, but my ultimate decision to never have children. And I think as women, if we don't want to have children, people think that we either don't like children or we've never thought about having children. Um, so these poems are just an honest depiction of my current thoughts about bearing children. Conversation with a willow tree on childlessness. Once I stood beneath a willow tree, its low mutterings having dragged me from the creek where I meant to find small turtles to fill my home with a slow calm. The small blonde child you look for cannot be born through you. In my stubbornness, I cut the tips of the tree's tendril hair for wild frill. I wanted my child to know the forest. I wanted the smell of home to remind them of the beginning, for their roots to be strong. So I dug for the trees, my face close to the earth in case of any sign. At a whimper, I pulled the dirt up in separate mounds as if the earth and I were not made of the same stuff. What lay beneath was only a small head, corn-colored hair turning brown with rot, milk teeth bloody with newness. Transformation is not always death. You are a child before you are a mother. I felt my own head, wet with creek, no longer covered in the light curls from childhood, and squelched its water, washed the small head in drips, and from the sky came a cry of birthing, deep but shrill, close but deaf. All right, so the next poem is titled, Our Child Before the Rain. Through your hair, I see our child, the space between your wet curls boasting of pearled light, 
Surely one of us should be at least halfway beautiful, but that's not how we're made, with certainty. My eye is pressed so close to your head now, my lashes flicker, and the light sheds its coral dress. The nakedness I fear is here again, wild and gray, dim as a child's tears. Would the child be ours? I'd like to think so, for the sake of a beginning, even a desperate one that moans and kicks as you do now under dreams I will know of when you wake. Lying with you, nerves cool and breathing, there is still a piece of me that wishes them unknown, their dreams already the full air before a quiet rain. Okay, so this next short poem is still about womanhood, but um, it's meant to emulate the misplaced disappointment in femininity that can come to one in a patriarchal society like the one we live in today. Um, so this poem is called Feminine. There's a blonde eyelash standing curled on my pink silk pillowcase, its tip made into power with a shine. You'd have to press your cheek deep into this pillow, have one eye smushed half closed to see what I see. I move my head to escape the sun's rays and the light shifts to the carpet, the possibility of magic gone. When I was a child, I hated the color pink. When I was a child, I would have been disappointed. All right, so just as a warning, the next four poems I have, um, I'm gonna sort of read in sequence and they are about trauma um, and its effects on the body and the mind. Yellow Moon. I scratch open my body while dreaming, my hips rising and falling to a silent tempo. When I wake, I show you the penalties of my sleep the lines swelling on my cheeks, flushed and dotted with bright red, the half moon shape I've scooped from my chest, already forming a yellow film. I apologize for my wounds and the fallen drops of blood I now point to one by one, your white sheets wrinkling beneath my accusing finger. You reach for this finger and fold it into your hand, steadying it. And instead of ask, asking me what I am so afraid of, you tell me of when you were small, how you would feed the neighborhood ducks meat sprinkled spaghetti until you found one dead, slumped against a brick wall. While you speak, our hands, pressed together, become irons, our bodies heating, our room misting with the murky film of laughter that settles over my waking mind as if my own body, for a moment, is not only flesh, but the yellow moon of an easy sky. So this next poem is titled, The Falling. I often dream of my father's house and the only pine out front, not cut down, the stumps of the others, markers of rot. I'm always standing atop the moon's filtered scattering of light when I hear the garage open. Someone knows I'm quitting. The tree's needled branches are hung with shadows, maybe ones that I know are baying the sky as I am for flight. The sky reveals nothing but clouds too thin to hide the moon as I reach for the closest branch and pull. Each new height leaves me sticky until the tree deflates, my jumping off point becoming as small as me, and I swear, if I could get higher than these houses, then I would float past and into a mossy farness, out to my mother, homeless, somewhere. The trunk is still depressing, and my foot slips from its hold, the falling slower than the climb. Each branch pushes above me, away from me, my legs pedaling at the air until I land at my stepbrother's feet. Knees bend slowly above me, hands are on my breasts, my head jammed into the pine's roots until it is over and someone is muttering sorry, pulling a shaking hand from my head. My blood is not red in this dark and my eyes meet the moon to reflect. 
All right, so this next short poem is titled Alone. I remember the velveteen rabbit and his sick boy because I'm a sick girl and I just saw a black sky bold in its purple shadow. But velvet can be any color and I am a woman, was a woman when I crawled to the bathtub, stopping just short to pass out in child's pose, my nose to the floor, hands pinned against my chest. When I woke, my feet were wet and in calling for my rabbit, my ears grew a bit longer and the tiles beneath me began to sprout green with a grief I've always known. Okay, so this last one in this sequence about trauma is titled Sick. The temper of the wind slips over my head, packaging me in a cool rage as the raw succulents grow on the now shadowed window seal, the air no more breathable than when they were not. The pool of water that collects beneath the cracked window during this storm dries on its own, remodeling the brown carpet into a bare soil. I am angry with my body. So I sit before the violence, afraid to open the window but still begging, my forehead against the cool glass, for the slapping of the rain to lighten me with its clear intent, wetness and growth. When the storm ends, what is mine is still mine. Spit on my window from where I almost fell asleep. Beneath the soil, the seeds of my life sit, each one a purple grin. And the dogs are melting through the window now with their dulcet bodies. They are here to dig for my seeds and I let them because I am tired. Their sound, a fleet of white doves, languid on their way through me. Okay, so I'm just going to go right into the last poem that I have for you and it is titled Endings. When the moon asks of my weeping, I reply, weeping is a door, and I'm not sure what side of it I'm on. Though I hear the whooping laughter of my madness imminent from some direction. Weeping is a cluster of lupines, my mother's favorite flowers, the ones she's never seen in person, the ones I refuse to grow in my child's garden. I keep the seeds in my pocket because weeping is the opposite of a garden with lemon-colored fences. It is the blank soil waiting to be guarded. My moon, weeping is you at your fullest, brimming with tears, vivid and looming, as if I could know anything of your sorrows. Dripping, my tears become one with the separate streams of the wind. A small insect is swept into my mouth, but before it finds its footing on my sticky tongue to depart, my hand brushes its wing and shudders. The many paths of this earth ending me. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. Um, thanks for listening. Hi, welcome. My name is Brenna Hossman, and tonight I'll be reading you a short story called Waxworks. Uh, it's gone through a little bit of a revision, I'm not sure if it's 100% there yet, but it's been a fun one for me to work on, and I hope it's a fun one for you to hear. So this is Waxworks. I met him on a bumble date in a tourist trap, an off-brand wax museum with King Kong hanging from the building. It was either going to be that, or the replica Titanic Museum, and the former seemed less somber. Plus, my date told me he had a coupon. The museum was not busy on a Thursday, the only day that we could both get off of work. We didn't realize until meeting up that we had crossed paths before matching on the app. My date, Anthony, was a food delivery driver, finishing up his last semester of college. Having graduated with a cinema studies degree, I was temping as a receptionist at an ad agency and handling the lunch orders that came in. One day, he must have carried in big bags full of Panera, and I must have taken them. I didn't remember. Maybe a thank you, barely a passing glance, yet weeks later, a swipe on our phone said something more. I was 23 and this was my first real date. My mom used to say that I lucked out by not dating in high school, as if it was a personal choice and not a product of my shyness. I remember my dad huffing a sigh of relief each time he saw me home on Friday nights, watching movies, my only date the lead star on the screen. After college, armed with a passion degree and a hazy future, I felt loneliness creep in like fog. I'd barely held hands with another person. 
Flirting was a foreign language. All around me, schoolmates were getting engaged, and it didn't help that my roommate Dinah had her boyfriend over each weekend. He had all but moved in with us. I downloaded an app for the hell of it, which amounted to a dreadful slideshow of guys who peaked in high school, who brought me back to the sweaty-palmed feeling of crowded cafeterias. Anthony was one of the few guys who didn't have a photo of himself holding up a dead fish, or who cited working out his pastime. I matched with him because his cat looked nice. When I pulled up to the wax museum, he was standing in the parking lot. He was a little short and very square, from his wide jaw and broad shoulders to the shape of his blue-framed glasses. I didn't know how to greet him. His bumble profile said Anthony, but what if he went by Ant or Tony? I opted out of a name entirely and just said, hey. I told him my name was Eliza. In truth, my name is Elizabeth. When I started work at the ad agency, answering phones and clicking pens and not knowing what to make of myself, I looked at the long mix of letters on my name badge and broke them down as if trying to glean something from the dissection. To the managers, I was Beth. To the janitorial staff, I was Lizzie. I became Ellie to the interns and Betty to the mailman. On casual Fridays, I wore just an E with my jeans. Somehow, I thought each new name could mold me into some better version of myself, the hard parts of me chipping away with each letter. At work, I kept waiting to be found out, but no one gossips about the temporary receptionist. Even if someone came up and demanded to know who I was, I was not sure what I would say. As we walked through a hall lined with figures of dead musicians, Anthony told me about a wax museum he went to when he was a kid. One of the fancy ones, he said, where celebrities go to have full-body casts made, where every minute freckle and hair is accurately rendered. He told me that the museum had a waxwork of Jennifer Lopez, posed seductively in a snug satin dress. It contained technology that caused a flush to appear on J.Lo's cheeks when patrons whispered into a mic in the ear. But everyone assumed the figure blushed when you touched her bottom. Men would line up to take a picture with the singer's likeness while copying a feel of her ass and waiting for the telltale blush to emerge on her face. Eventually, the museum removed the figure. Too much negative attention, plus the back of the dress was grimed with fingerprint stains. They replaced J.Lo with a replica of the rock. Why did they have to get rid of her completely? I asked. What do you mean? There were imprints in the wax from people squeezing too hard. Couldn't they have roped her off, put signs up, make sure no one touched her again? Anthony shrugged. People would have just complained. Better not remind them of what they can't have. I took in that advice. I did not offer him my hand to hold. Though I didn't have high hopes for this date, I found myself just a little bit disappointed that I would not have my first kiss by the end of this. After all, I'd basically created a new identity. Eliza wore lipstick. Eliza had curled her hair. Eliza had a skirt on. Hell, Eliza shaved. Even if someone were to get a kiss today, it would be Eliza, not me. We entered a room full of outdated action movie characters, all men, I noticed. Pierce Brosnan's James Bond aimed a gun at us as we walked by. Rambo and the Terminator made eyes at each other from across the room. I looked closely at the Tom Cruise figure. Something about it looked off. Anthony asked me why I was staring. His teeth are too straight, I said. Too even. Oh, Eliza, don't worry about that. I think your teeth are just fine. He didn't get it. Anthony changed the subject. Hey, the next room is the horror chamber. You know, Jason and Freddy and all that. It's kind of dark, so I don't know if you want to go in. I think I'll pass, but please, you can go on ahead. I'll meet you in the gift shop. Suit yourself. I watched him stumble away. I allowed an exhale, not realizing I had been sucking in for the past half hour. The waistband of my skirt cut into my stomach, but it was almost a welcome feeling. Eliza melted away. I wished her well, wished she could have gotten her kiss. Aside from the generic action movie score pumping through the speakers, the room was oddly quiet. I was the only one here, yet it was hard to feel alone. A dozen pairs of glass eyes stared blankly from all sides. There was a figure I almost didn't see, one seemingly shoved into the far corner of the room, halfway hidden by Jack Sparrow. It was a likeness of Brendan Fraser from his role in The Mummy, donning a leather vest and 90s boy hair. I remember being fond of the movie, yet here was the figure in dim light with a faded, barely legible placard. Poor Brendan Fraser. I felt an odd jolt of tenderness for the figure, a thing forgotten and cast to the shadows. I stepped closer and saw how unnaturally smooth the flesh was, how dull the blue marbled eyes seemed. There was a layer of dust stuck to the wax. The museum didn't even bother to clean it. On my tiptoes, I reached eye level with the tall waxwork and gently blew on its face, watched the dust cloud scatter. My balance wobbled, and for the briefest of moments, my lips brushed against the waxy nose. Looking around the room, I assured myself that no one had witnessed the accidental peck, save for that Tom Cruise statue who looked like he knew something was up. I felt relieved, but then I heard a deep voice. Well, you're a little close, aren't you? Sure enough, the wax figure spoke, its eyes blinking like a doll. The stain of my lipstick marked its nose. You can't just go around kissing people without their permission, you know. 
Did I just see the molded lips part the corner of the mouth up turn into a smirk? No, no, you're right. I'm sorry. I didn't really mean to offend you, um, Brendan. No, I'm not saying I minded it. It's not every day I'm kissed by a pretty stranger. He attempted a wink. Oh, and don't call me Brendan. Never met the guy. The sign says I'm Rick O'Connell, but I don't know. I haven't seen the movie. I guess you can just call me Rick. Okay, Rick. Despite being inanimate moments ago, this wax figure was charming me. The heart-jittering nerves of a first date came back. Then I remembered the incidental first kiss. For once, I dared to be bold. Hey, do you want to get out of here or something? Hell yeah, they're going to put me into storage next week. He took an initial step, tin man stiff at first, but his gait became convincingly human. Maybe even I could convince myself. Rick was the one to take my hand, so cool, so smooth on our way out. I don't think I got your name. I like to know who so rudely kissed me. It's Elizabeth, I said. We somehow passed unseen through the gift shop and into a, late, a summer late afternoon, my body feeling a heat unrelated to the weather. Growing up in Pigeon Forge, I was used to the kitsch landscape, the roadside tourist attractions as common as churches or banks. Driving down just a short stretch of parkway, I'd pass the improbable, the wax museum's cityscape, the Titanic striking an iceberg, the giant cartoonish barn, barn of a themed dinner show, the building tossed upside down. All facades, of course, trying to sell tourists an idea of this mountain town. But they were the fami familiar features of my home, as natural and as nonsensical as the wax figure in my passenger seat. Rick bug eyed through the window each passing landmark, the dozens of hotels, the mini golf and go-karts. So this is the world. Just a weird corner of it, I said. Amazing, he said, still gazing through the windshield. Do you work at one of these places? He pointed to the year-round Christmas store. <laughs> I laughed. If only. No, I work at an agency that advertises these places. Is that fun? It's a job, I shrugged. So, no, not really. But I don't know what else to do. What do you want to do? I paused that this is a question I ask myself nearly every day. I like movies. Maybe I can make them someday, or, or something. I like some of your movies, by the way. <laughs> They're not my movies. Right. Sorry. Soon I took a turn and we escaped the tourist trap, cruising by a view of hills and trees. What about you? I asked. Was being at the museum fun? Rick blinked. I don't really remember. Not many people came up to me, took my picture, or things like that. But you came along. You saw me. His waxen face brightened. He was actually quite beautiful. Yeah, I did. I'm kind of glad I kissed you. Can I ask you something? Why did you kiss me? I smirked. It seemed like a good idea at the time, I quoted from his mummy character. The reference went over his head, but he replied, I think it was a good idea too. My cheeks felt hot. Can I ask you something now? Why are you still holding my hand? My right hand was still locked in his, having never let go since leaving the museum. Because it's so warm, Rick said. I've never felt this kind of warm. I then felt his hand squeeze, the wax rippling around my fingers. I understood. It was lucky that Dinah was gone on a road trip with her boyfriend. For three weeks, I had the whole apartment to myself while Dinah escaped with her love to the Pacific coast, camping in truck beds and cheap inns. I remember wishing her well on the day she left, clenching a goodbye smile. I remember that night tenting a bedsheet over my head, lit in my own campfire glow of the bumble screen, feeling lost and lonely. Now a different feeling occupied this bed, a solid thing made of beeswax and fiberglass, the hinting scent of honey on his skin. When Rick undressed out of the film costume, I was surprised by his pale body, anemic, unpainted where the clothes had been. But the body was strong, the sculptor had indulged in every curve and rigid muscle. Hollow strength, I knew, yet enough to hold me, an artifice I bought into. You were George of the Jungle underneath it all, I said. Rick didn't get the joke. He was bare down there, Ken doll smooth, and I was relieved to see it. Naked bodies were an enigma to me, others and my own, yet I found myself in this bed stripped to flesh and fuzz, all me, all Elizabeth. It didn't matter that we fumbled, stiff-limbed, both born new to this world of life and touch. It didn't matter that there was nothing between his legs. He had his long, cool hands, and it felt enough for me. I felt enough for me. We were still in the middle of a southern summer, the heat wave coming over like a flood. My apartment's air conditioning was spotty at best, and Dinah and I usually opted to sweat it out, windows wide open. It wasn't ideal, but we figured we could make it until autumn, counting the days between. When I woke up, I realized with horror what the heat could do. Unsticking myself from Rick's body, I stood and saw that he'd gone soft. He'd only partially melted, enough to become doughy, but I could see the mold of where my body had been impressed in him. His stomach was concave, his leg bent in an unnatural angle where it lay. Rick was awake, staring at me. 
He grinned so warmly, as if he didn't realize the mess that he was on the bed. I began to cry. Elizabeth, what's wrong? <sighs> Look what I've done to you. God, I'm so sorry. He looked down at his body and shrugged. It's fine, really. Don't feel a thing. But I feel awful. I should have known it would be too hot. I forget you're not... Listen, Rick sat up, uh, swinging his crooked foot over the side of the bed to face me. I knew something was happening. I saw my body changing, but, you know, I could have moved away from you. I could have kept my shape, but I didn't, and I think you should know that. This, this admission struck me deeply. Here was Rick, who quite literally made space for me with all the willingness to change, to have his body morph and melt, a tall risk just to hold me. So, so much of this doesn't make sense, I started. So when I say that I think I might be falling for you, I know that sounds crazy, but it's also new to me. <laughs> Everything is new to me. This life, this feeling, you. Elizabeth, you're the best person I've, never, I've ever known. I knew his catalog of people he knew was slimmer than a pamphlet, but he was genuine. I watched Rick try to walk toward me, arms outstretched, but his bent leg betrayed him. He fell to his knees, which flattened on impact. I tried to help him back up. We've got to fix this. Cranking up the air conditioning on high, which blessedly worked this time, I went to work at massaging Rick's legs. While he was still soft and malleable, I reformed him in my hands like clay, working up each limb until my arms wrapped around his waist as I tried to reshape his torso. I paused there, felt the need to be still, embrace. Head against chest, I listened for a heartbeat I knew it wouldn't come. I pretended the sound of my own was both of ours. When the cool air kept him solid, Rick looked better, but not the same. The sculpted abs he had were replaced by a swirl of puckered wax. One leg looked skinnier than the other. I was disappointed to see this beauty go. But then I saw freckled up and down his body were the subtle marks of fingerprints. Mine. To come home to an apartment that was empty no longer and have someone like Rick waiting for me was surreal. I felt a jolt each time I unlocked the door to see him standing there, unmoved from when I last saw him, and smiling. I asked him what he did while I was away. He said he just stood there, waiting for hours. It was all he knew to do. One day he asked me if we could have a movie marath- One day he asked me if we could have a movie night. He said he was curious about his doppelganger, so we sat down to a Brendan Fraser marathon, first with his fish out of water flicks like Encino Man and George of the Jungle, a typecast that was feeling all too familiar now. I surveyed his face during all of the mummy movies, seeing his eyes widen at the character he was based on and wondering if the recognition ended there. As the credits rolled on the final film, I muted the TV and waited. So, Rick finally said, that's who I'm supposed to be. What do you mean? I modeled off that Brendan guy. I guess I should be more like him. What? No, you don't have to do that. Well, who do you want me to be, Elizabeth? He asked. I told him I just wanted him to be himself, but was this true? Rick made me feel special, made me feel like I could be my own self, yet I was searching for something special in him, something to prove to me that he was as human as he appeared, that he had a life inside of him beyond just me, someone with a story. I didn't know if he had a story. I had to fill in the blanks. Ever since the day at the museum, Rick had only spent his time at my place, alone or with only me. I didn't want him cooped up forever, so I planned a date for us, our first real outing together, an experiment on how Rick would function in the real world. His museum clothes wouldn't do, but thankfully Dinah's boyfriend had his own drawer in her room. I picked out a dark blue long sleeve button down and some faded je jeans that were a bit too big. He looked overdressed for the summertime heat, but I couldn't risk anyone seeing the obvious dents and bumps on his skin left over from his melting. We ended up at an outlet mall far from the city's tourism, an introduction to some sense of normalcy in Rick's new life. Still, he appeared odd at nearly everything we passed, from Build-A-Bear to coffee stands and photo booths. We did step inside one and pose for a trio of sweet photos. I looked so happy. I put the strip of film in my bag. There were countless couples in the mall holding hands, and as we walked around, I recognized that I was finally part of them. I, too, had someone by my side, and it didn't feel like pretending. My hair was casually tossed up in a bun. I was barefaced, but I didn't care. The person beside me saw me, saw Elizabeth, and even though he was a six-foot mannequin, did it feel any less real? Rick did attract some attention on account of his looks, his height, and the stiff way he walked. I tried to steer him into the emptier shops, but one woman approached us in a hat store. She was probably mid-thirties, her head tilted and not quite recognition. Sorry, she said, addressing Rick, but you look so familiar. Are you someone famous? Rick looked at me wide-eyed. Not exactly. I swear you look like some actor. Gosh, what's his name? What happened to him? You must be mistaken. I took Rick by the arm and moved past the woman. He's nobody. I felt Rick go stiff in my grip. He looked down at me, hurt. I told him I didn't mean it that way. 
He was quiet for a while. Something unanticipated. My mother was shopping here. By the time I spotted her at the entrance of a department store, it was too late. She came our way, half running with shopping bags swinging from her arms. There's my girl, my mother said. Dear, it's been weeks since we talked. Her eyes flicked to the man beside me. She squinted. And who is this? Hey, Mom, this is Rick. My mother smiled, nodded at Rick. She took a step away but pulled me closer. Is that the guy, she whispered, the one from your date? I nodded. It was true enough. Gosh, he looks nothing like the picture you showed me. I can't trust anyone these days. We looked back at Rick. He was standing off to the side, a little awkwardly, and very still. It was eerie how still he could be. So, Rick, what do you do? My mother asked. Rick began to speak, stuttering over his answer. I guess I stand around a lot. He means he poses, I said. He's a model. I see. Well, Rick, I hope you know there's more to life than taking pictures. Mom. She sighed and said in a hushed voice, Really, Elizabeth, are you even ready to date? I know you're new to this, but dear, do you really think this is the guy for you? Some pretty boy with no personality? Mom, he can hear you. I looked to Rick. He was staring down at his feet, despondent. He didn't look at me. I think it's about time we get going, I finally said, reaching for Rick's hand. Rick felt like dead weight as I led him away from the mall. I begged for a sign of life from him, just a squeeze of the hand. When we reached my car, I felt the shaking of his body, and I wondered then if glass eyes could cry. We went back to my apartment, and for days Rick didn't move. He sat motionless on the couch, unblinking and brooding. I worried that whatever spell had brought him to me had lifted, that whatever life he had had vanished, and I would be left alone with an oversized figurine. I hugged him, kissed him, said his name over and over like an incantation. Finally, I felt his body tense, more rigid than normal. Please don't call me that. What do you mean? Rick? But you told me that was your name. He pulled away, his face contorted, the wax wrinkling around his mouth, his eyes. I almost thought he was melting again. I reached up to smooth those lines, sculpt them away with the touch of my fingers, but he stopped me. No, Elizabeth, no. I'm not Rick. It was just the name that was there, and I just took it. I don't understand. He stood. You were right. I am a nobody. I didn't even know what to say to your mother, because what is there to say about me? I don't know who the hell I really am. You're not a nobody, you're mine, I said. I mean, isn't that enough? He started pulling at the shirt I addressed him in, revealing his stomach. Look, you've had a literal hand in the shaping of myself. I wish I could be who you want me to be, but I'm not Rick. I'm not Brendan Fraser. I don't know what that leaves for me. You deserve someone who knows who they are. We can figure that out together, can't we? He looked at the floor, not meeting my eyes. You'll be fine. I've seen you. You know who you are. You don't need me. Please don't cry, Elizabeth. He took my hand in his, still so smooth. You've brought me to a life I never never would have had otherwise. I'm so grateful for that. And I just want to make use of that gift. Do you understand? I didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand love. I didn't understand how a waxwork could come into being. I didn't understand why he stuck around. I didn't understand why, as I collapsed as a mess on the floor, he still took me in his arms and held me all throughout the rest of the day until I fell asleep, my body pressed against his in an attempt at reformation, wishing I could be the one to melt away. I only understood when I awoke, when I noticed that he was indeed gone, my purse left open beside my bed. He took no money, just the film strip of our photos. All he left behind were his museum clothes and a severed wax hand. When Dinah finally got back from her trip, I was cocooned on the couch, nursing a headache and watching The Mummy because it was on TV. It wasn't very healthy. She burst through the door, toting a half dozen bags on her arms. Hey, girly, she called. Miss me much? Hope you didn't have too much fun without me. She detailed her trip, from the Rockies to the beaches to her boyfriend. I could only pretend to listen to so much. Then she told me she bought me a souvenir. Now, it's nothing too special, Dinah said as she rummaged through a gift bag. But I wanted to bring back something from the Pacific Beach. Get a whiff of this. It's a homemade beeswax candle. Dinah didn't understand why I was crying. Searching for him was futile. He could be wandering in the woods somewhere, the branches of the trees carving him out. He could be a melted puddle on the side of the highway. He could be packed up on a bus halfway across the country. There was no way of knowing. I went back to the wax museum just once. When I broke him out of there, I wondered if there would be a search, if I would read or hear any news report of a stolen wax work. But there was nothing. He was easily forgotten. Maybe, eventually, it would be easy for me, too. It wasn't likely he would go back, but I thought it was worth checking. I reached the action movie room, found his designated corner, and saw that the placard with the name he took was gone. He wasn't there. Standing there in his place and taunting me with a raised eyebrow was a newly sculpted statue of the rock. Why was it always the rock? 
A few weeks later, I saw Anthony again. I was back at work, though my temping days were numbered, and I would have to figure out what was next for me soon. Rick showed me how easy it could be to leave. Maybe I could, too. The office had called in a large Panera order to celebrate someone's birthday. Anthony came in carrying ba paper bags full of bagels and bread bowls, which he set down in front of my desk. He stood awkwardly as I wrote a company check for the tip. We exchanged nonsense small talk, neither of us acknowledging that I had ditched our date. His eyes wandered, landing on an object on my desk. Cool paperweight. It was a model of a hand, wide and lifelike, reaching out from where it stood on the desk as if trying to grasp something. Thanks. It was a gift. I gave him his tip, which he pocketed. Take care, Eliza. Nice to see you again. It's Elizabeth, actually, I said. Anthony left, looking young and disappointed, and I felt sorry that I could not be the person for him. I felt again the rush of loneliness come over me, a tidal wave I'd been swimming in since he left. My heart tight and breath shallow, I reached for what would calm me. My hand placed against the wax one, I felt its cool fingers held on, telling myself I will be all right. Thank you.